time. I know I have. I've had a great time in Revelation, and uh, boy, it's been a blessing, and we are in the, the conclusion. We are on Roman numeral number two. If you want to go ahead and open your Bible to Revelation chapter 22, and um, we're going to look down at verse number six, and we're going to go ahead and read from verse number six to verse number 16, and we're going to get started with this. I don't know that we'll make it to the end. We may, but uh, let's see how it goes. Amen. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at verse number six. Uh, if you're there, say amen. amen. Revelation chapter 22, not too hard to find. Actually, this should probably be about close to the last page of your Bible, right, for your maps <laughs> or your concordance. And verse number six, and, it said, and, he, and he said unto me, these things are faithful and true. I like that, don't you? And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. In verse number 7, if your Bible has red print, Jesus is speaking here. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the, what? angel which showed me these things and then saith he unto me see thou do it not for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book worship God good thing to tell him in it and he saith unto me seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book for the time is at hand he that is unjust let him be unjust still and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the what? The bright and morning. He is not Satan. I am the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, there's, there it is, that means anybody, God wants everybody to be saved, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life, how, what, freely, that means you don't earn it, it's free, Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we love you this evening. Father, we pray, Lord, that our minds would be open. Lord, we need the power of God tonight. Father, we need the Holy Spirit of God to illuminate as we look at the conclusion of Revelation. And Father, it's been a joy. It's been a blessing, Father, as we've let, read and studied through Revelation these last few years. And Father, what a joy it's been. It's not only helped us understand uh, you, Lord, but it's helped us understand the scriptures, which we know is you, and it's revealed you in the scriptures more to us and father what a blessing father i pray that it help us to be able to witness and visit with people and father we ask lord as we look into this last closing chapter lord you to illuminate uh, some things that are important that are key and lord help us to use them to apply them and to share them in jesus precious name amen look with me if you would roman numeral two notice it is the seven closing promises we're going to see the seven closing promises here, uh, but before we do, let's look at the giver of the promises in verse number six, and it said unto me, these things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets, what, sent what? Are you there? Verse number six, his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. <clears throat> These promises listed below come from Jesus Christ. Note sixfold identification. N number one, the Lord God of the holy prophets, the one who gave us the word of God through the apostles and the prophets. Look over at 2 Peter. I'm sure you have this memorized, <coughs> should have. 
2 Peter chapter number 1. One of the things that people have a discrepancy, I've heard this just recently, I sure you have. Uh, well, uh, the Bible is just written by men. Who's heard that recently? I heard that just in the last few days. Uh, no, it wasn't. The Bible was written by men. No, it wasn't. That's why we haven't been able to burn it, right? Um, you know what's interesting is history proves that the Bible was not written by men. You say, why? Because we've tried to destroy it, and the Bible itself says that no one can destroy it. You know what's interesting, too? Just facts. I'm just giving you facts. The number one selling book still to this day is the King James Bible. I wonder why. Because it's God's Word. We can't get it, we can't get it out of here. It's God's Word. It'll always be here. It'll always be the number one book, won't it? Because it is the book. Right. Look at uh, 2 Peter 1 and verse number 21. It says, For the what? The prophecy came not in old time by the who? Will of man. It didn't become because of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by who? The Holy Ghost. So let me ask you something. What does that say about these holy men? <clears throat> now, who is calling them holy? Us? No, God is calling them holy. God chose holy men to be what? His pen. As they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So God wrote the word of God. That's a good verse. You need to remember that. You should, you should memorize that. Write that on a card. Put it in your mind. Put it in your pocket. Because you know what? People today don't understand why we believe the Bible. Amen. Because it's God's word. Amen, right? Come on, help me, amen. It's God's word. If it wasn't God's word, why are we here tonight? Well, you're not saved if it's not God's word. Amen. The prophets were the human writers, but the Lord God is the author. Note the statements here constitute another proof of the deity of Christ. Look at verse 6 compared to verse 16. It's right here in your notes. The Lord God sent his angels to show, verse 16... I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify. Number two, so we see uh, the Lord God of the holy prophets. Number two, we see God in verse number eight and verse number nine. It says there in eight and nine, let's read it. And John, I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard them, seen, fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which uh, keep the sayings of this book. What does it say there? Worship who? God. Worship God. Overcome by the revelation thus given, John falls down to worship. You say, I would have never done that. You're a liar too. Come on now. We, you know, there's been a lot of things that John's, remember the Lord said, the, the angel said, write on. Keep on writing. What are you doing? Write. I'm telling you what to write. Right? Quit looking. Write. Amen. <laughs> now he's saying, don't worship me. Worship God. I'm just an angel. I'm a fellow servant. I like that, don't you? Worship God. Overcome by the revelation thus given, John falls down to worship the angel, for which is he is soundly what? Good. That's what he deserved. He needed to be rebuked. Let me help you with this, child of God. You say, how can I apply this? Let me help you with something. Uh, this is something that the church doesn't do, which they should. We're accountable to one another. And when we're standing there while another Christian is doing something wrong, we need to hold them accountable. Are you listening to me? Pay attention. The angel didn't say, well, it's okay. He, he knows better. No, he doesn't know better. Don't worship me. I'm a fellow servant. He rebukes him. You worship God. Are you listening to me, child of God? Don't talk like that around me. I'm a child of God. Shame on you. You know better. Well, you don't have to do it that way, but you need to rebuke him. Right? Don't have that attitude around me. Maybe we need to pray. The sad thing is, is uh, God forbid, if we rebuke a child of God because we have to worry about something called anger. Shame on us. Right? You know, the Bible says that a child of God loves to be rebuked. We're supposed to have joy in rebuke. Why? Because we find out where we're wrong. It's not, our, it's not the other Christian's fault that you're embarrassed. You should be embarrassed. Let me ask you something. 
I didn't know this was going to come up. I had no idea. Let me ask you something. Do you think John was embarrassed? You better believe it. Right in front of God Almighty, that angel's rebuking him. You know what God's like? Good job. Don't say I'm afraid. Shouldn't be afraid of man. The Bible says we're not supposed to have fear of man, are we? Wait a minute. Man is higher than the angels. That angel knew that John was higher than he was, but he rebuked him anyway. Are you following me? All right. Let's go on. Number three. We see the Alpha and Omega. I love that, don't you? Let me tell you something. God has no beginning, but he is the beginning. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, try to, try to figure that one out. <laughs> and, and he is the end, which has no end. <laughs> we can't comprehend that because we have a beginning and an end, right? Amen. Uh, number four, we see Jesus in verse number 16. It says, I who... You know, he puts his name there so you know for a fact. I, Jesus, have what? Sent my angel. I, Jesus. So we see Jesus. Number five, we see the root and the offspring of God, or of David, in verse number 16. This Now, this is interesting because this is proclaiming his earthly identity. The root and offspring of David. Uh, would that not signify his, uh, his being your savior? It would, because he's the root and offspring. He is the line, uh, the line of Christ, of Jesus. Praise God for that, amen. You know, he's making identity here. He's letting you know, not only am I, I'm Jesus, but here's my identity in his earthly reign. My, I am the root and offspring of David. Look at number six. He also proclaims, I am the bright and the morning star. This is his heavenly identity. Let me help you with this. Satan has always wanted to be the imitator. One person that's always wanted to take the place of that word has always been Lucifer. Why do you think the other perversions, come on, they take Jesus' name out and put Lucifer's name. You say, where do they do that? Where in Isaiah, where it calls Jesus the bright morning star, they put the son of the morning that's Lucifer. Lucifer is the son, not Jesus. Jesus is the bright and the morning star. Now, now, that was subtle, wasn't it? And it was sly and it was cunning. And you probably didn't even know that. And you probably wouldn't even caught that. Amen. That's why, you know, that's why uh, when the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah 53, he said, how can I lest a man? Amen. It is important to be a part of a church that teaches. It is important to be in the house of God to learn these things because how will you know lest a man uh, show you? Amen. B, the recipient of the promises. The recipient of the promises. Note, as, as noted in Revelation 1, verse number 4, let's turn there. <clears throat> Revelation 1 and verse number 4, let's read. It says, John to the what? Are we there? Revelation 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches. This book is addressed specifically to the Lord's what? churches just so you know it's not just to the seven churches those are seven types of churches and we have all the churches in those types just so you know those aren't church ages either that that remember we learned that that's false uh, because we see all of those churches today amen and so this is the recipient of the promises are the lord's churches now let's look at the promises as he has them outlined here now letter c the Lord promises, number one, and 6a, <clears throat> and he said unto me, these things are faithful and true. The Lord promises that this book is the word of God. Aren't you glad? This is from his mouth again. Amen. Just so you know, he said it before. He's saying it again. As he, remember, this is the conclusion. The conclusion. We're not talking about prophecy anymore. He's talking to the church again. This is, the, this is where the church is being talked to again, here from verse 6 to the end. Remember, there's no mention of the church from chapter 4 all the way till here. Now, because we're not talking about the future, we're talking about right now. Are you following? He, what he's saying? 
Guess what, church? The word of God is true. It's faithful and true. You know, let me tell you something. That's something that needs to be put in your mind today. What do you, people are saying this. You, you, there's people that raise their hand. I'm not the only one that's heard this week that they don't believe the Bible because men wrote it. Well, why are you in church? Huh? As fantastic as many of these prophecies may seem, they will happen because God said they would. You know, everything that has been prophesied has come true. We're just waiting for the rapture. Amen. Number two, here's this, the first promise. Don't, aren't you glad that that's a promise? That should make you excited that this Bible is faithful and true. Come on, child of God, this is all we have. This is that which is perfect has come. We have the perfect, infallible, faithful and true word of God. I, I, that's, a, that's why that's number one. This is it right here. When that which is perfect has come, remember the, uh, the sign gift ceased. Right, because this is the sign, right? All right, let's look on. Number two, here's the second promise, that these prophets are not are next for the fulfillment according to God's prophetic timetable. Look at 6C. Uh, uh, okay, it says, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets said his angels to show his servants and the things which must uh, shortly be done. And then look at verse number 10. <clears throat> and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Amen. Uh, so the second prophecy, the things which must shortly be be done and the time is at hand now pay attention to this next thing in your notes such expressions do not I have this double highlighted here do not necessarily mean did you see that okay do not necessarily mean the what rapture Daniel 70th week the return of Christ will definitely occur within the, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen within the next 70 uh, seven years it's been over 1905 years since John received the revelation what it does mean now I have this triple highlighted right here this next sentence what it does mean is that these things are next in God's plans what the rapture it's next it doesn't mean it's happening tomorrow. No man knoweth the day or the hour. He's going to come as a twinkling in the eye. He's going to come. We're not. You better be ready. You better be ready. Hey, maybe he'll come while we're on the way to Utah. Maybe he'll come and we'll be able to lead Christy Lynn to the Lord. And she'll be able to understand that her God is not God the Father. And that Jesus is not her brother, but her Savior. And he is God. And Joseph Smith is in hell. He is. Look on with me. Daniel 8, verse number 26, and Daniel 12, verse number 4, where Daniel's prophecies would not be fulfilled next in order, the gospel age commencing with the preaching of John the Baptist and Mark 1.1 1, 1, was to be the next major period. Now listen, here's where we're at today. Circle this next part. Highlight it. Put an asterisk by it. Today there is no, do you see that big capital no? There is no Bible prophecy requiring fulfillment. There is no more fulfillment of prophecy before the rapture can take place. The events predicted in Revelation 6 through 19 to unfold. We're just waiting on the trumpet. Man, you would think more Christians would be a little bit more excited. No, they're not. Amen. They're not. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of them who say they're Christians aren't. Remember what faith is. Faith is if you take what you believe and put it to action. That's what faith is. That's fruit. You say, what is fruit, preacher? You take what you believe and put it to action. You can't say, I believe in Jesus and don't go to church. That's not faith. That's not true. That's a lie. You can't say at home and never go to church, never read your Bible, never pray, and say you're a believer. You're a liar. 
you need to call them on it. I have. And they have no, nothing to say. And they're like, you're right. I, I know I'm right. I don't know that they're saved, but based off what the scripture says, they're not saved. Because if you're saved, you take what you believe and you put it to what? Action. Amen. Even believers who don't know, know they're supposed to be in church. Did you know that? Even believers who don't know, who are truly saved, know they're supposed to read their Bible, don't they, Corinda? So, why aren't they? They're lost. A wise preacher told me that everyone, you should assume everyone is lost because you don't know who's saved, and most of the time they're not. You'll know them by their fruit. What's their fruit? Church attendance should not be your only fruit, friend. Number three, the promise. You know, there's church attenders that are going to be in hell. They're faith, more faithful than you. Number three, the promise of Christ's return. Look at verse 7a and 12a. Behold, I what? I come quickly. Be Praise God, come quick. My back is starting to hurt. I'm starting to get old. My hips are starting to hurt. My knees are starting to hurt. I don't want to get where OJ is. OJ, I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I feel bad for you. I really do. When I sit down at the end of the day and my back begins to hurt, the first people I think about are people that have, Chris, I've been thinking about it. My back has been hurting and I have to go to work. And I don't look forward to that. And Lord, please come quickly. But not at the sake of my loved ones not being saved. But remember... They have to choose. You can't choose for them. You want to know how to win them? you got to live a Christ-centered life, not a self-centered life. That means you've got to take what you've learned and put it to action. That doesn't mean be like them. You can't befriend them. you got to be Christ to them. That may repel them, but that's what will bring them to Christ. Just so you know, my kids don't like to be around me very much. Not because I repel them because of my flesh, but because I repel them because of this. They, you ask, if you ask my children, they tell you they love their daddy. My daughter wants nothing more than to have the close, close relationship with me. She tells her mother that all the time. But there's a hindrance there. And it's called a Christ-centered life. But she knows where her daddy stands. She told me not too long. I don't know if she's watching. I don't really care. She told me she hopes one day that they'll come back to our church. Well, you know what? Whether she goes to church is not for me to say. I just want her to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. Now, I don't want to be her friend or her buddy. And you shouldn't want to be people that you're trying to witness to friend or buddy you have to be christ to them and the only way you can be is to have a christ-centered life they'll thank you my my daughter told us this when she moved when she was running from the world or running from god she said the one thing that she always remembered while she was running we continued to be faithful to the church faithful to the lord and that's why she came back to the church not because we chased her Amen. Can't chase people. You got to let God do that. Am I helping someone? I hope I'm helping someone. Amen. Number three, promise. I'm helping my wife, I guess. Maybe I should be a little louder at home. Amen. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> Amen. How about this? I like this. Now, maybe we need to read that next one. Today, there's no Bible prophecy requiring fulfillment before the rapture. Can I tell you, that should make you understand how, how, terrible, uh, how terribly close it is. You want to know how terribly close it is? Look around. Look at the wickedness that's going on. I just cannot believe it. H have you not watched the news? I mean... Uh, can you remember a time where Russia would have done what they've done? No way. No way. They would have never done what they've done. That was $32 million piece of equipment that they put down. If any other president would have been in that office, that would have not happened at all. You don't think we're closer than ever? Hey, that's not, that's not the only sign. Look at the wickedness around us. Homosexuality. All kinds of wickedness. Number three, 
the promise of Christ's sure return. Behold, I come quickly. This is a promise that refers to the rapture, not the second coming. Why? We are now in the epilogue of the book. Remember, uh, now he's referring to the church right now. Remember, we already talked about that. He says, Behold, I come quickly. I've just told you of things that are going to come, and you've got to understand. I'm co- Let me help you, church. He's coming quicker now than when he wrote the book. Everything's been fulfilled. Get busy. I know it gets, gets hard, don't it? It gets frustrating, don't it? I don't know why people won't listen. You can't worry about that. That's living a self-controlled Christian life. If you're doing it with yourself, you'll get down. There's a lot of people in church that could make your preacher down, make him want to quit. I've told somebody else that just earlier. There's a lot of things that are going on within the church and the church people that would make this old man of your preacher just want to quit. You want to know what keeps me going? Christ, not you. Don't say, oh, preacher's keeping on going for me. No, I'm not, because I'd have quit long ago. I'm not looking on to you. I'm looking on to Jesus. I'm not preaching for you. I'm preaching for Christ. You want to know where you're going wrong and why you fail? You're not living for Christ. You're living for self. Shame on you. You want to know why you're getting angry so much? Because you're living for self, not for Christ. Amen. Remember what you're supposed to do in the morning. Me too. Right? All right, let's look at these promises of the first, the rapture, not the second coming. Boy, I'm telling you, people like to twist the scriptures, don't they? So why are they referring to the rapture? A, we are now in the epilogue, which is the conclusion of the book, which is addressed to the particulars of the churches. Uh, Remember, prior to this, the church is is, is with the Lord. Remember, we just talked about the church in eternity, did we not? Now he's, he's ended that. Now he's referring back to the church. B, the blessing of verse number 7. Look at verse number 7. It says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is that... Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy of the book. Amen. This is referenced or addressed to churches. The churches of Revelations 1 and verse number 3. C. The promise of rewards here applies to present day New Testament churches. Look at verse 12. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Amen, right? What reward? My reward is with me. This is the rewards. Remember, when we go to the when we stand before the Lord, remember in Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 1, that's the rapture, right? When do we get our reward? When do we get our reward? What happens when we when we go to heaven? When the church goes to heaven? We stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Which really isn't a judgment. We get what? crowns okay yeah so we'll we'll we get our rewards all right and what do we do with our rewards of course we do we give them back to christ and guess what guess what he does with our rewards he makes one crown the crown of many crowns amen isn't that amazing amen so just just so you know the rewards here applies to the present day new testament churches amen the only reward the church gets are the rewards that we get when we stand before the what judgment seat of christ that's how we know that this is written to the churches look at uh, number four and verse seven the second part blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy of this book the promise of of blessing what is a blessing what is what does that even mean it says blessed what is that is that not a beatitude we're going to talk about that in a minute aren't we hey let me this reminds me of the beat the, the sermon on the mounts what they call it and it's the beatitude message do you, does everybody remember remember that okay and he says blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed do you know that was the message to the to the disciples just so you know uh people didn't go up the mountain uh the disciples were there so he's basically preaching to the church and and actually the lord's which i need to preach that message i've written it up i'd written it up like two or three years ago uh, but uh, the lord's not ever directed me to do that but anyways these are ways that you can be happy 
Amen. Uh, boy, that, that's a good message that we need to hear one day, right? How the Lord teaches us how we can be happy. Wouldn't that be nice? Huh? All right. But anyways, there is a promise of blessing. There is a promise of happiness. Number five. Uh, now remember, he's talking about the church. You say, well, I'm not happy. I'm just miserable. You know, no matter what's going on around you, just so you know, Jonathan had a lot of bad things happening. His life came just in those two chapters. His life came under uh, scrutiny of death uh, twice. But he wasn't unhappy. No matter what's going on, you can still be happy. There's, you can still have a promise of happiness. Number five, notice the promise of eternal uh, security. And here, here we go for the naysayers that don't believe that once saved, always saved. Look at verse number 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. This is the part he's pulling out. But this verse clearly teaches that our eternal destiny is settled in when? Right now. Right now. This is talking to the church. Uh, the, 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 I don't like saying church age because this is the age of grace. All right. Uh, but just so you know, our eternity, not just ours, all humanities, what they do right now is going to settle what happens in eternity. Isn't that amazing? So our eternal destiny is settled in this life. The condition in which we pass in eternity, whether we're saved or lost, is the condition we'll remain in throughout eternity. Amen? A, a wonderful statement of eternal security. Nothing can change our justified position of being righteous before God in Christ. Notice an exclamation point. Nothing. It says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Now let me help you with that understanding that statement there. How are we righteous? Through Christ. So he's talking about a saved person there. The Bible says that when you become saved, you put on righteousness. You don't get it. That would be your garments that you see when we go to heaven in our soul. Isn't that amazing? Our soul garments. Amen. The garments that the, the Mormons try to make for earthly, right? <laughs> but anyways, praise the Lord. All right, let's look on here. Uh, a B, a powerful refutation of some doctrinal error, errors. One of them is purgatory. The ability to change one's eternal destiny by passing through a purging process after death. Remember, there's no way. Amen. Those who are, notice what that says. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. It ain't going to change. Uh, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. It ain't going to change. Once you've made that decision and you've died and you've passed from life unto death or the rapture happens, there's nothing you can do to change it. It's over. I had someone ask me the other day. I couldn't believe they asked me this, uh, especially for who they are. Uh, but the young man that was working with me, Corinne, uh, he, he goes, what, what happens to babies? I'm, I'm just, I'm, I don't understand what happens to babies and people that die that, uh, that maybe they're mentally retarded. And I'm like, what? And your parents are Christians? Remember who God is. God so loved the world. God doesn't want to put anybody in hell, friend. If we die before we have a comprehension, we go to heaven. God's not that way. God's not that way. Are you listening? They did not willfully choose. They couldn't even choose to put a sock on. Are you listening to me? There's some 45-year-old people that will die that don't have a mental choice to even how to eat. And you're going to tell me that God's going to... No, he's not. They don't have a comprehension level to get saved. We say, where are they going to be? They'll go to heaven. Now, they didn't get baptized. They won't be a part of the bride, but the, praise God, they'll be a part of the family. My son, guess what? He died. He was 18 days old. You say, where's he, pastor? He's in heaven. Now, he hasn't got his body yet, but he's in his soul. His soul's in heaven. You say, how old is he? I don't know. Whatever the perfect age, age is when you get to heaven, I don't know what the age is. Do you? 
You know what? When God created Adam, this will help you. He didn't create a baby. He created a full man. So how old was Adam? We don't know. Because God created a man. He didn't create a baby. Amen. When he created Eve, he created a full-on woman. He didn't create a baby. Adam didn't have to coddle a baby woman and wait till she got no. They were full adults. Amen. So what's the perfect age? I don't know. Probably whatever age Adam and Eve was when he created them. I have no idea. So, I mean, age is really not relevant, is it? So what maturity level will be perfect? How's that? You say, what age is that? I have no idea what perfect is because we will never, we don't even know what perfection is, really. Look at the next thing that is a refutation of annihilation. The cessation of existence being turned into nothingless after death. The word still refutes this teaching, meaning they're still alive. They're still life. Regardless whether they're lost or saved, they'll still exist. Are you following me? So if they die lost, they're lost still. That should scare you. Actually, you know, if it doesn't sadden you, there's probably a problem because it saddens the Lord. That's why his epilogue or his conclusion here is all about being serious about getting people saved. Notice the next thing, universalism. The idea that all will be saved, that God will never send anyone to hell, that refutes that because it says that there's those choices that they made. If they choose to be, what, unjust, they're unjust still. If they choose to be lost, remember, it's a choice. They're going to be lost still, amen? There's no universalism. Not everyone's going to heaven. You have the choice to make. C, a further indication of the awfulness of the lake of fire it shows that all the in injustice, the filth, the corruption, and sin will continue on in the eternal fire. Amen. That's where it deserves to be, don't it? Amen. Just like Christ, when he died for your sins, when, his, when he died, he took all your sins. Where did he dump them? He dumped them in hell. Guess where they get dumped after hell's done? The lake of fire, amen, all sin and all death and the curse. When he does the new Jerusalem, when he, what does he do? He rehabilitates or rebuilds the earth and he creates the lake of fire because if it's the perfect earth or the perfect place for us to inhabit, there's no need for the lake of fire or hell to be in the center of it. There'll be no bottomless pit anymore. Because that was the old earth. They were there because of sin. Amen. You know, that's why there's the bottomless pit. Because we know that Christ put, uh, put uh, some of Satan's uh, generals. And, and we already know a multitude of angels go in there. There are so many that when they come out, John's like, oh my word, they're like locusts. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's scary. So if there's that many in the bottomless pit, or yeah, locked in the bottomless pit, how many are free on the earth? Because it said a third of heaven. Well, how big's heaven? Well, that'll get you thinking. All right, let's look on to six. There's the promise of eternal rewards, verse number 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. And to give every man according to as his work shall be. That tells you right there, uh, just in the wording of that verse, it tells you it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Because he says he's going to give according to every man what his work shall be. That's the judgment of your works. Amen. Are you with me on that? Okay. And so we're reminded of three things concerning the judgment seat of Christ. He even agrees with me. A, my reward. In this judgment, the searching eyes of the Lord will what? Examine us. It sure will. Man heaps his own uh, accolades and uh, awards upon himself, but man is not the judge on this occasion. How will Christ see me? That should be your question. Not how does pastor see me, 
Let me tell you something. You'd probably live better if you would ask, how does Christ see me? You know, I had someone ask me, they say, well, if we come to your church, what should we wear? I says, I don't know. How do you think you should dress for God? I said, I think it's pretty sad that you dress for a funeral. You know what the Lord told the disciples? Let the dead bury the dead. Uh-oh. Are you listening? Why don't we dress nicer for a funeral than we do church? Ouch. How about asking this question? How does Christ see me? Am I, am I giving my best? Wow, that's a, that's a message that'll preach for me. You say, man, preacher, you're being harsh. I'm not either. The Bible is salt, friend. If it don't burn, there's a problem. You say, maybe we won't get so much burning when you're gone. Maybe Brother Roel, he'll be a little nicer to us. Amen. <laughs> he better not be preaching all on love. I might jack slap him. <laughs> Amen. All right. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's look at this. The searching eye of the Lord, they examine you. How will Christ see me? I, I love that. I hope you double, triple highlight that, circle that. That's important. I, you should ask yourself that question. How does he, don't say how to, don't, it don't matter how I see you, friend. And just so you know, I see you as a church member. That's how I see you. I see you as my brother and sister in Christ. You know what I have to do as a child of God, just as you do? I got to pray for you. And I can't see you for, for what you do. God has to be your judge. It would be a shame if the pastor has to come talk to you because of things you've done when God's been talking to you and you won't listen. What good does it do the pastor if you won't listen to God? I haven't got no authority outside of God. Shame on you. Uh-oh. All right, let's go to B. Notice we've seen my reward. And notice we also see what? Every what? Every man. No one will be excused or exempted. Amen. You say, uh, guess what, uh, Pastor, can you not call on me? And there ain't none of that, buddy. Uh, I don't want to stand up in front of everybody. Uh, too bad. You want to think it's hard here in this church? You wait till we're standing before the whole bride of Christ. Oh, there's my grandpa. Oh, my word, he's going to see that. Oh, whoops, I did that for myself. You know who you should feel bad about is how does Christ see me? Because he does see you. And he will reveal you. So we need to get out of our pride. We, we have nothing to be proud about. I must be honest. I, I don't have anything to be proud about. Right? No one will excuse or exempt me. Notice B or C. Notice it says as his work not a judgment of salvation but of works and service for the Lord we're already saved we've made it to heaven now we're trying to receive our rewards now I'm trying to help you because all the teaching is pointing to this right here I didn't put this together God did you can't say oh Ben preacher did a good job putting all this no I didn't I'm not that smart God's putting this together he's trying to help you see that you have to live in in the you gotta live uh, for Christ not for self you've got to ask yourself is this what Christ died for is this what he lived for this is what's all showing you how to get your rewards if you're doing it for yourself you'll fail you'll be tired let me tell you something. I, I remember a lot of times laying in my bed crying and saying, Lord, I'm, I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I don't want to do this position anymore. But I love to preach, Father. I just love to feel the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't do it on your own. You say, how do I, how do I pray for you, preacher? Pray that God uses me. That's, I just want to be used by God. Pray that God lets me set myself aside. Guess what? Why don't you pray a little bit of that for yourself? Because how in the world are you going to hear what I preach if you don't? Not a judgment of salvation, but of works and service for the Lord. It is a judgment to see how we build upon the foundation of our church. You know... I'm not going to turn there, but no greater, there's, not, there's already been a foundation laid. Jesus did it, okay? But he laid a foundation for you to build on. That's this church. How's your work? 
You know, I've seen some workmanship, and it's been awful. I, I had to take over for a plumber on a uh, contract because I had my surgery. He had to have another plumber come and do it because I was, I was having that surgery. But he, he could not wait for me to get back. He said, I've never had so much issues in my whole life. They get the house done, it's spray foamed, and they have gas leak. They have no idea where it is. They get the house done, the people are moving in, they got water leak in the wall somewhere, they can't even find it. He says, every one of the jobs that you've done, I've not had that problem. I can't wait for you to come. I don't care if you're a little bit more. I'd, he says, I'm going to actually let you do his, take over his. I'm like, oh, my word, what a mess. What does your work look like? Can I tell you something? Regardless whether I do my job in the county, I have to think like this. Is this what God wants me to do? Is this how I want my house built? Oh, you know what? In the county, I don't have to follow codes. Most plumbers go, okay, well, then I won't do it a code. Do you know, I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you because the Holy Spirit, he starts bugging me. He goes, that's not how you would do it if it was inspected. Let me tell you, child of God, your work is inspected. He's watching. Let me ask you, are you getting a red tag? You know, red means bad. It means stop. That doesn't, you're not doing that for me, and that's not good enough. Or are you getting a green tag? Just so you know, you actually know. So when we go to stand before the Lord, because we all will, we pretty much know what we've done for him and what we haven't. And sliding by isn't doing anything for him. Can I tell you, you don't get really get rewards just for coming to church. That's not being faithful. Right? Where are we at? Number seven. Let's close with number seven, and we'll have to pick it up on verse uh, Roman numeral three. I did just too much good stuff. I'm not going to go through it like that. I just, I just can't. I, I can't be. I can't be compelled by the Holy Spirit to slow down and then hurry up and go through it. So let's finish number seven, and then we'll stop on Roman numeral three. So number seven is the promise. It almost makes me want to cry. This is so good. I wish we could just. Anyways, the promise of eternal life. <laughs> wow, isn't that good enough for you? I mean, what's the problem? You know, next time you get upset, I'm talking to myself too. Don't look, I'm not looking at you. I'm, I'm, because I was kind of grouchy the other day. The next time you get like that, why don't you think about this? You say, well, think about what? You get the promise of eternal life. Do you know the, the promise of the judgment doesn't really, <laughs> doesn't too excite me. You say, why, preacher? You're, you're doing a lot for the Lord. Yeah, it doesn't really excite me because uh, I know who's going to be there. And I'm not Paul. I'm not John. I want to be. I'm not Charles Spurgeon. I don't want to be them. I want to be like Christ. But I'm still not good enough. Are you listening? But guess what really gets me? I get eternal life in spite of myself. Let me ask you this. How will Christ see me? I didn't know I was going to be preaching a message. How will Christ see me? I don't know about you. I feel like we need to close right here. I'm going to have my wife come play a verse of invitation. Let's all stand with our, our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Let me ask you tonight, in view of the eternal life, that God so graciously gave us. I only ask you to self this tonight. How does Christ, how does Christ see me? Not how a preacher sees me, how does Christ see me? What a good way to end the service. As she plays, will you come? How does Christ see me? Will you come? Will you come?
Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, to be in your house, Father. I pray, Lord, that we'd have learned something, Lord. I pray that we'd take the things that you've taught us, Lord, that we would take the things that we've seen in the Bible, that we believe, that we know is true. And, Father, I pray we'd put them to action. Lord, it would strengthen our faith. And Father, I pray we'd use these questions, Lord, that we've seen in the Scriptures How does Christ see me? Father, I pray we'd use these. Lord, I pray that you go with each and every one of us tonight. Lord, keep us safe. Father, I pray you'd go with us as we go to Utah. Lord, help us to be the witness that we need to be. Father, we pray for uh, 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 guidance and wisdom. And Father, we seek to please you, Father. And I, Lord, we'd... I pray that we'd all live that life that way, Lord. I pray that you'd illuminated things to us here in the Word of God that we'd hold to it. Father, I pray that we'd be faithful, Lord, to your house and to you. And, Lord, we'd be giving you praise, and we'd ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Praise God.